So, welcome to this uh, class on uh, neuroscience of human movement. Um, so, in this class, we will continue our discussion on uh, cerebellum. So, this is part 4 of our uh, discussion on uh, cerebellum. So, in this class, we will be talking about uh, recurrent loops that uh, cerebellum has with cerebral cortex, inferior olive and uh, Golgi cells. We briefly mentioned this in the previous class, uh, we will discuss uh, that with some details in this class. So, a major recurrent loop with the cerebral cortex. So, the cerebral cortex sends information to the cerebellum not directly, it is not like that, but rather through pontine nucleus or through pons, right. So, through that and through that as shown here, right. So, so pons serves as an important source of input to the lateral cerebellum. What do we mean by lateral cerebellum? Lateral cerebellum means cerebro cerebellum, is it not? That is the reason this cerebel, this region of the cerebellum is also called as cerebro cerebellum, right. So, the more uh, medial regions are the spinocerebellum and the flocculonodular lobe is the vestibular cerebellum, we have seen this in the previous classes. So, and the output from the lateral cerebellum goes via the deep nuclei. So, actually not shown here is the deep cerebellar nuclei. In particular, what is the nucleus that is responsible for uh, sending uh, outputs to the cortex are processing information from the cerebellum. Right. So, that is the dentate nucleus. So, from the lateral cerebellum projection is to the dentate nucleus and from the dentate nucleus to the thalamus more, more specifically to the ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus. So, the thalamus then relays information back to the pre and primary motor areas. So, effectively completing a loop. So, the information starts from the cerebral cortex from multiple regions of the cerebral cortex and reaches the cerebellum via the pons and that is processed in the cerebellar cortex and via the dentate nucleus it reaches the ventrolateral thalamus and from the thalamus back to the pre and the primary motor cortex. So, this is one recurrent loop and this is one of the prominent uh, recurrent loops that the cerebellum has with the cerebral cortex. Right. Then the other uh, recurrent loop is with the inferior olive, we have said this inferior olive ha is one of the powerful or primary sources of input. So, there are two sources of uh, two major sources of input to the cerebellum, these are mossy fibers and climbing fibers. Mossy fibers include all the inputs, all inputs except inferior olive. This may be from pons, this may be from so, inputs that originate from pons, input that originate from spinal cord and any other region are called mossy fibers. Inputs that originate from inferior olive are called as climbing fibers. We saw what is the special feature of these climbing fibers. Climbing fibers climb through the, the granular layer, they do not make a they do not make synapses with the granule cells, but rather they directly synapse with the Purkinje cells make hundreds of synapses with uh, each with one Purkinje cell for example. And uh, in a powerful manner influence the output of the Purkinje cells and we also saw that you know one uh, climbing cell can uh, innervate up to 10 uh, Purkinje cells, but a given Purkinje cell receives input from only one climbing fiber. Right. So, so that information is a very powerful source of uh, information is the climbing fiber and it turns out that the deep cerebellar nuclei can also negatively or uh, inhib can also inhibit the inferior olive. So, in other words the cerebellum can regulate the inputs that it receives from where 
and what kind of information it is going to be receiving right and note also we discussed that uh, inferior olive neurons are electrotonically coupled or in other words there is there are gap junctions information communication within inferior olive between some groups of cells is electrotonic or electrical through gap junctions right this we discussed earlier so this involves another uh, recurrent loop of course then the output goes via the cerebellar nucleus to thalamus etc is the is the story that is not mentioned then the other recurrent loop is somewhat different from the previous uh, loops note with the in the previous two cases the recurrent loops were formed with structures outside the cerebellum these were uh, cerebral cortex and inferior olive but this recurrent loop the third one is with golgi cells is situated entirely within the cerebellum so it turns out that the golgi cells are inhibitory interneurons so these are inhibitory interneurons that are excited by the mossy parallel system right so in the glomerulus they are excited by the mossy fiber and parallel fibers also uh, excite the golgi cells and in turn these golgi cells inhibit the granule cells right what would be the purpose of such an arrangement is the question note that the number of uh, let's remind ourselves that the number of uh, granule cells is about 100 billion we said that so if all of these cells are simultaneously active it is not clear what is the meaning of that so because of this reason it is required for us to have excitatory uh, inputs from only specific granule cells that need to be active so that means that that means there is a need to control which granule cells are firing when etc so golgi cells perform this crucial activity what could be the effect of golgi cell activity on granule cells well there are two ways in which uh, golgi cells could uh, affect the functioning of uh, the granule cells first is uh, it could affect the magnitude of the total response Uh, I'll explain that in a minute, and it could affect the duration of activity of the response. So when I say the response, obviously I am not talking about the response of individual granule cells, but rather when a bunch of granule cells are uh, active simultaneously and some of them are uh, inhibited when uh, when say 10 granule cells are simultaneously active and say four of them are uh, inhibited then the sum total of their activity will reduce so when i say magnitude of the response will reduce i'm talking about the response of, or the total response of this system of the set of neurons under configuration so obviously individual action potentials will not reduce their magnitude not duration will not change so that is known so that is the stereotypical nature of action potentials that will continue for each individual cell but when I turn off specific cells speci particularly by using uh, Golgi cells the total uh, output from a set of neurons will reduce or if I do not turn off then it will increase so I could selectively uh, modify the magnitude and duration of the response of multiple cells one hypothesis about uh, this function of Golgi cells is that in some sense the Golgi cells are encoding a form of uh, sparse code right so you want to keep a whole bunch of granule cells uh, silent and Golgi cells perform this crucial uh, function only those granule cells that need to be active at a particular time are allowed to be active keeping all the other cells uh, relatively silent because uh, the number of granule cells is very large you cannot keep them active simultaneously and respond to their uh, activity so probably 
the Golgi cells encode some form of sparse code. This is an interesting hypothesis it continues to be uh, discussed in the literature. So, in this class we have seen uh, recurrent uh, loops that the cerebellum has with cerebral cortex uh, this is via pons the cerebellum as in the lateral cerebellum or, or the cerebro cerebellum and uh, VL thalamus via the deep nucleus or the via the via the dentate nucleus. Then inferior olive cerebellum it inhibits the inferior olive. So, cerebellum can control what kind of in or from what kind of input it is going to receive and to what extent it can regulate its own inputs. Golgi cells regulate the function of granule cells. Okay. So, with this we come to the end of this class and in future classes we will uh, discuss vestibular cerebellum, spinocerebellum and cerebrocerebellum. So, thank you very much for your attention.